a little bit extra background on myself. Um, I've been in the white nose world now since 2011, and I started as a field ecologist and still consider myself a field biologist. So um, this postdoc is kind of a deviation from that to learn about how best to basically make my science most applicable for managers who need to make these really hard management decisions regarding host survival and minimizing pathogen spread. So um, I'm going to give you a little overview of, um, let's see here, hopefully it starts going, a little overview of, here it is, um, what structured decision making is and when it's useful, um, discuss a couple case studies from white nose syndrome and really dive into one in particular, and then hopefully if there's time, um, any questions. And um, at the end of the presentation, I do have my email address. So if there's maybe some burning questions that are not able to be asked, please feel free to email me um, afterwards. So um, I'm just going to jump right in here. Um, what is decision analysis? So it's the structuring of a decision problem. So that means we're structuring it in terms of choices, outcomes, and values. And really it comes down to identifying the choice that is most likely to achieve those values. So although, you know, you guys are all sounds like scientists in training or have been trained as scientists, when it comes to making a decision, it's more than just the science that you're going to need to consider. It's coming down to uh, using science to identify among a suite of choices and get those predictions on how the outcomes could most likely um, be achieved, but ultimately it's coming down to a lot of these values. So decision analysis is mixing those two worlds. Um, it's involving the valuing, uh, the valuing of the outcomes and then predicting outcomes from alternative choices. And so the first part is the subjective role of society. So there are things that um, decision makers have to care about outside of, of just um, something that they care about. You know, it's, you might really think bats are important, but it could be that your stakeholders and your public entities that are using the parks or, or using these public resources um, really are providing some of that insight or some of that, um, that value. Um, the second part is more of the objective role of science. And so, like I said, that's where science is coming in to help inform decisions, make those predictions, but ultimately, ultimately it's that nice dance between values and, and science. So for values focused thinking, it's really the fact that when we break down a decision, we're gonna be discussing the values first because that's gonna be driving the rest of the analysis. And oftentimes our intuitive decision-making usually skips way ahead to the alternative. So instead of thinking about exactly what we want to have achieved, we think about the problem and then we jump ahead on how to fix it. So we kind of mix or miss the opportunity to think about the other values that are needed. And I'm gonna show you exactly how we can combat that um, skipping ahead uh, in, later on in the presentation. So the decision context and the fundamental objectives that frame a decision situation must be compatible. And this is a, a quote from Keeney, Ralph Keeney. He's one of those godfathers of decision-making and he's really brought this into the foresight of um, into natural resource management. So when we talk about objectives, we're thinking more along management objectives, not just objectives of a study, but the true objectives that a manager needs to consider while making a management decision. And so those should be sufficient to fully evaluate all of the alternatives or the actions or management actions that um, are identified. And these alternatives should be sufficient to describe all the various ways in which the objectives could be achieved. So not just um, maximizing persistence of bat populations, but also say minimizing cost, minimizing non-target uh, effects, um, maximizing multi-use management, um, things like that that can be really important to a management decision. So we use a formalized approach to framing and solving decisions, um, and this focuses on the decision makers' values in a structured decision making process. So it really comes down to identifying the problem itself. Um, and the problem is going to be that trigger or the reason why a decision needs to be made in the first pay place, identifying these values-based objectives, coming up with alternative actions, thinking about consequences and trade-offs. 
And it's important that this process is transparent and focuses on each aspect of the decision directly. So in addition, uncertainties can be evaluated side by side, such as those induced by variation in climate forecasts, um, system responses, and other aspects of the system which are incompletely understood. And however, addressing only those uncertainties which could change the optimal action is useful. So there are some uncertainties that um, are interesting. They're scientific curiosities. Um, example, um, understanding how fast a bat flies is really cool to think about. It's really interesting, but ultimately um, it's not going to help differentiate between a management action. So we want to make sure that <clears throat> the uncertainties that we are including are identifying these scientific needs that directly influence a management decision. And so those are considered um, critical uncertainties or something that if you have this piece of information, you know exactly what the next step is going to be in your decision making process. So with um, decision making, um, you can break it down into its corresponding parts. And so that comes down to problem, problem framing, objectives, actions, consequences, and trade-offs, or PROACT. And this is something where when you're in a structured decision making workshop, for instance, the goal is to get around this circle um, definitely once, if not twice because, and that's considered rapid prototyping. And the reason you wanna do that is because oftentimes you'll have that, you'll identify the problem, um, you'll inform some of the problem by say laws or policies and preferences of your agency or um, the rules of what you have in your mandates. Um, and then you might get to alternatives and realize that you completely forgot something. And so this is an iterative process that's really, really useful because oftentimes we find when we get to maybe step five or six, whoops, we missed something and that's okay. That doesn't mean that anything's wrong. It just means that we need to go through it again and make our, um, identify our objectives, alternatives, consequences, and so on more explicitly. And I'll go more in detail about this um, when thinking about the bat example. So structured decision making is kind of a prescription for resolving a lot of decisions. And this again is a, a diagram from Keeney. Um, he's written this great easy to read paper called Making a Better Decisions. And ultimately what um, he describes is that, you know, every day, um, hypothetically, we could come across 10,000 different decisions. And some are seriously no brainers, you know, is, uh, you know, you're not going to walk out of your house naked, for instance. You're going to put pants on. You're going to put clothes on. That's a no-brainer, at least for most people in society. Um, there are some that maybe have small consequences, but ultimately only about a 1,000 of that 10,000 decisions that you might think about over the course of your day, only a 1,000 are really worth carefully thinking about. But then if you get to, um, let's see, I'll try my little pointer here. When you get to be here, they're really only, of those 1,000, only 40 get systematic thought. And so of these 40 decisions, 30 are resolved by um, using qualitative concepts of decision analysis, maybe to guide clear thinking about the problem, objectives or alternatives. Um, and then subsequent to this, when you get down to this region here, there are really only 10 additional questions that are resolved by using true quantitative analysis. And then four can be resolved by going through and um, thinking about, you know, describing the consequences. Um, finally, about six of these 10,000 are resolved by using more quantitative concepts of decision analysis. And that's when you get into maybe more um, higher tier modeling, um, things like that. But ultimately, a lot of the decisions that you come across, even in decision making within natural resource management, can ultimately come through by just giving that systematic thought where you're thinking about your objectives, resolving any clarification problems, um, and maybe thinking more creatively about alternatives. So it's, it's a useful tool, but you don't necessarily have to use the entire um, structured decision making process in order to uh, solve maybe a management decision. So structured decision making is not a panacea for all problems. Um, it's very useful um, in making broad and flexible set of tools that can be applied in a variety of settings. So it's useful when your management objectives are known or agreed upon. Um, it's also um, 
when the uncertainties are pretty well understood, um, but it's okay with um, some un uncertainty in the outcomes. But ultimately, you know, there are some instances where conflict resolution methods are better when, say, the objectives are deeply um, disputed. So that could be when, um, for instance, there was a paper out recently by Mike Mitchell in talking about um, cougar take or hunting of cougar in Montana. And it was really all about conflict resolution because the managers had a certain set of objectives they were wanting to identify and solve for, whereas the stakeholders, which were hunters and other um, people that, you know, like hiking and seeing cougar, they had a completely different set of um, objectives. So there's a high disputed uh, some disputes there. So they use conflict resolution tools to really get into those objectives prior to even thinking about making management decisions for, um, say, hunting quotas for cougars. Um, there's also, um, SDM can be broadly applicable when the scientific aspects of the decision are well known or not. Um, however, joint fact-finding is sometimes used when the science is disputed, and it can be a way to engage stakeholders and develop a common ground, um, because sometimes you just don't know what those outcomes are going to be. So that's kind of the broad, basic overview of SDM and kind of the, the justification for why we think it's useful. <clears throat> um, but now I'm going to go into um, more detail for um, white-nose syndrome specifically. So this is um, a paper that um, Evan and I wrote, and it was working with um, Jonah Evans from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And um, it was a, a pretty um, fun uh, opportunity to work with the managers to really work through these problems. And I'm gonna describe those um, throughout the rest of the, the presentation. So, um, but on top of just working with Jonah, we were able to work with three other managers and um, Jonah's case or Texas case is going to be what I'm diving into, but I do want to give you a bit, a little bit of an overview of who else we worked with um, within this uh, process. So we worked with three managers from across the pathogen progression zone. <clears throat> and I know you all are very well attuned to this, but um, just as some explicit background on what my definitions are for uh, pathogen progression zone is that um, the areas where PD is present, white nose is present, and there have been mass mortalities. I'm considering that the established zone. The intermediate zone is going to be where PD is present, but um, white nose syndrome has not yet been detected or has not caused massive declines. And then the uh, presumed PD free is where PD has yet to be detected. Um, via fungal swabs or any type of um, histology. So the first person we've worked with, or I should say the second person we worked with, uh, Jonah was our first, but um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, we worked with Alyssa Bennett. Um, she is well within the established zone, you know, right next to house caverns where uh, PD was, or in white nose syndrome was identified in the 20, 2006. For her um, management scenario, um, she has had massive population de uh, declines across multiple species. Um, she does have persisting populations of little brown bats in Aeolus Cave. However, you know, she used to have Indiana bats and northern long-eared bats, but they're just not found at all anymore. So her management goals were to maximize population growth rate of the little brown bats and hopefully um, other species that may be persisting in Aeolus Cave that she hasn't been able to see in a while. Uh, we worked with Jonah uh, from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. He's one of the co-authors on that Texas paper that I'll talk about. Um, he's in the intermediate zone of white nose syndrome. So again, PD positive, but no white nose, at least at the time of um, our study. The scenario that he was dealing with is that, you know, an eminent arrival of PD in a known susceptible population of tricolored bats in um, eastern Texas. And his management goals were to prevent establishment of PD in those sites, while also minimizing the impacts of white nose syndrome if PD does become uh, identified. And then finally, we worked with um, Rita Dixon, the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. She is in that um, presumed PD free. Her scenario is that she has large populations of hibernating um, myota species, as well as Cornerinus townsendii. Um, it's presumed that these species of myotis are likely going to be impacted by the disease, but it's, we have no idea yet. Um, uh, it's a show cave. So Minnetonka Cave is 
a cave that gets about 50,000 visitors a year. And it's a huge tourist destination and a big economic boost for southeastern Idaho. So her management goals were to minimize the establishment of PD while also maintaining populations of bats uh, in Minnetonka Cave, as well as keeping the cave open because, like I said, that's a, that's a big um, management objective for them because it, it brings money into the community. So again, um, decisions uh, are made in six distinct steps. And so uh, as a decision analysts, we work with managers through each of these steps. And this, again, allowing for an iterative, transparent, and defensible decision-making process. So with um, all of the managers, we went through and identified the problem that trigger being white nose syndrome, either uh, present and um, you know, causing mass declines, uh, likely to be introduced or um, maybe likely to be exacerbated. And then we went through objectives, their alternatives, um, estimated consequences, and then trade-offs and optimization. And then um, what the great thing is that we actually did get to the decision and take action step. But, you know, it took us several times to get through this iterative process. One of the first things we did um, to turn the resource management problem into a tractable management decision was to frame the problem as a decision by identifying the trigger and population or species of interest. And so in the previous slides, you saw that we identified that. We knew what species or group of species we were thinking about. The trigger is um, white nose declines, PD introduction, or maybe PD introduction to a, um, a large tourist cave. Um, management authority and jurisdiction. We want to make sure you identify those because not, you know, sometimes, say for Jonah's case, he might be the only one that's in charge and the only decision maker, but sometimes in other instances, there are multiple decision makers that need to be involved in the decision making process. Um, it's also important to identify the frequency and scale of the decision. Um, and that gets to, you know, identifying how much ground is needed to be covered, how often a decision needs to be made. Uh, needs to consider all different constraints. And so oftentimes these constraints are going to be cost or um, some, some type of um, thing that is not going to be allowed really ultimately, for instance, like with Minnetonka Cave in Idaho, that cave likely is not going to be closed due to how much money it brings into the community or how much money it might bring in the Forest Service. So that could be considered a constraint. And then finally, we need to identify and recognize uncertainties and possible trade-offs. Okay, into that case study. So Texas presents a really unique case to this study um, because PD, you know, is now common throughout Eastern North America. It's moved past Texas and now in several states in the U.S. Thankfully, uh, as far as I know, Western Canada still seems to be okay-ish, um, at least as far as I know. Um, but only recently has PD been detected in northern and central Texas. So the arrival of PED uh, in Texas is of particular concern because of the mixing pot that it is. So there are a lot of western species in the state that are presumed to be naive to the fungus and therefore may be vulnerable to the disease. There are a lot of the um, highly susceptible eastern species, so tricolored bats, little browns, big browns. Um, a lot of those species are also found in Texas, so it's um, a likely place where things can get moved around. Not to mention you have highly migratory species like Brazilian free-tailed bats that are um, within, uh, they can fly and move the fungus around even if they aren't necessarily going to be succumbed to it. Um, the wildlife managers at Texas Parks and Wildlife expect the manifestation of the disease within the next several years. So generally the transition from the introduction of PD to populations exhibiting white nose syndrome, especially in the southeastern United States, kind of occurs within two to five years of PD introduction. So that at least as of 2017, when we were working with Jonah, um, this may allow for enough time for proactive management, which is pretty exciting. 
Um, Texas is home to a lot of bat enthusiasts, meaning that the public is likely to be a vocal if they witness massive declines in their bat populations due to white nose syndrome. Um, again, thinking about how often and how many people come to see the Brazilian free tail bats and the Congress Avenue Bridge. They have a whole bat festival down in Austin. And so there's a lot of tourism, a lot of value that society in Texas has put on bats, which has been um, pretty useful and pretty nice um, as far as um, as far as I'm concerned, but it also helps because that's going to be a big important boost for um, Texas Parks and Wildlife to make a decision. So our study um, and working with Jonah focused on tricolored bat populations <clears throat> because we know that they are a highly susceptible species, especially in other parts of their range. Um, many tricolored bats have been completely extirpated from their hibernacula, even in Tennessee, um, Georgia, um, places like that. And I know farther up in, in New England and in Canada, uh, where they're now a species uh, or listed at least um, in, many, in many places. Um, except under our ESA. Um, but the interesting thing is that the tricolor bat population that we were looking at um, was only uses culverts in East Texas. And so this is pretty exciting because this basically eliminates a bunch of trade-offs that Jonah was going to have to consider um, because these are artificial hibernation sites. They are not going to be affected in the same way that a natural cave site is going to be. So the purpose of this is that, you know, we were going to be looking at um, trying to implement some sort of action in these cave hibernate or these um, culvert systems while also considering how the decision may vary or, or be different when Jonah thinks of a natural cave system. And I think still to date, I checked um, just before the our call here today is that these areas in East Texas are still considered as of last winter to be negative for the pathogen. So that's still pretty promising. So we met with the decision maker and subject matter experts to identify what, if any, management alternatives could be implemented in the tricolor bat culvert system. And so using SDM, we identified the decision maker's management problem, explicitly defined his management objectives, identified a range of potential management actions, and then predicted consequences for each action on all the objectives. And then we were able to identify trade-offs among these objectives to determine which action or which optimal decision provided to be the best for the system. And so, you know, just as another uh, boost for this, the rationale and the, uh, this is a rational and transparent process, and it's been used extensively in economics and business and is a useful way to work through these complex decision problems. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service, mostly John Reichard and Jeremy Coleman, have really been um, excited to use this in the natural resource um, uh, region just because it has been really important um, in other uh, facets of everyday lives. Um, just to point out who everyone is in here, this is Jonah, our decision maker. We had Nate Fuller, who was working down in Texas out of Texas Tech as one of our subject matter experts thinking about the different bat uh, species. And then um, John Reichard here was our other, um, one of our other experts. Uh, and he was here thinking about the various treatment actions. Um, Jeremy Coleman and Christina Kocha were there, but not in this picture because we had a major snowstorm. Well, major in Massachusetts context, maybe not can, uh, Canadian context. And especially for Texas, they were not used to the snow. All right, so getting into the management objectives um, that we identified for Jonah for his culvert um, problem. So the first one, of course, was to maximize the persistence of tricolor bats in this system. And the numbers that I have above each of these objectives is basically the weight or the, the percent of Jonah's cares that have been placed on these um, management objectives. And this is where the values of the decision maker and of society and of individuals the decision maker is emulating come into play. So this is what's going to help differentiate and uh, tease apart how well actions do for these various management objectives. So Jonah cared about 57% for the BAT objective. He wanted to minimize cost of implementing management intervention, and he cared about that about 9%. So 9% of his cares went to cost. He wanted to minimize water contamination from any management intervention. So about 20% of his cares went to uh, water quality. And then about 14% of his cares was to maximizing landowner acceptance. 
And so you can see that ultimately, because he doesn't have, he's thinking about things in a culvert standpoint, you know, he really cares a lot about these bats. Cost is not um, much of an issue, at least for Texas, you know, this weight can vary in other management, for other managers, or other management jurisdictions. Um, and he really wanted to think clearly about all these things. For landowner acceptance, um, a lot of this was coming into the idea, not just that the landowners would be okay with um, putting some sort of treatment into these culvert systems, but ultimately also thinking about how often a treatment would need to be implemented or how many times Jonah and his crew would have to be walking over someone's property, ask, knocking on their door for um, you know, approval to be on the land because he knew that maybe the more often a treatment had to be applied, so once versus six times, that could maybe um, be a detriment. So when it came to um, thinking about our actions, that was something we really wanted to think about. So during the workshop, <clears throat> we also discussed the particular life history events for each of the species. Um, for the, um, again, for Texas, we were thinking about tricolored bats. And so we wanted to make sure that we were drawing out the system to um, include any type of timing or um, things that we need to think about where a bat would be moving from the hibernacula, maybe to their transition roost or to their maternity sites, and then coming back into the, um, the uh, hibernation site. And ultimately, this was thinking about how we should best implement actions. Was, were the actions going to be implemented when the bats were present? Were they going to be implemented when the bats were away? What was that timing and frequency of, of bats using these um, culverts? And so this is just kind of to clarify thinking um, and to help spur any creativity when it comes to identifying all the different man management actions. So <clears throat> we identified 22 management actions that varied from the status quo. So do nothing or no active management um, is considered making a decision. Um, and so we included that. We also identified various actions that were um, just applying them on a bat um, application in a site only, and then we came up with a combination or, or portfolios of, of treatment. So much like you would um, in your financial portfolio, you know, you might have some that are maybe more risky, um, some um, financial incentives could be pretty important that way. So we were thinking about that when we came up with these portfolios or these combination of treatments. Can we do some, some additive things or can these things be working in, on top of each other um, synergistically? Um, of course, the alternatives we chose to include in the decision uh, were not an extensive list, but are the options and methods of the decision that the decision maker felt comfortable with considering given his various management objectives. Um, and I'll show you a, a list of them in, in a little bit. So <clears throat> after identifying um, the problem, thinking clearly about the objectives, um, weighting the objectives, so placing those values on them, um, thinking about all the alternatives, then the, this is where the subject matter experts came into play where they were then predicting how well each action was expected to do for all management objectives. So for um, on the y-axis here, um, this is the weighted scores. So basically this is the, the sum of all the predictions that were then normalized and multiplied by that weight for each objective and their totals. So all the single treatments are here on this first part and then this after this um, vertical line are the combination treatments. The status quo, again, the do nothing or do nothing additional, continue with what's going on. Um, that is this first box here. And then this dashed horizontal line kind of indicates how much things deviate, um, the different alternatives deviate from that. The two colors here are looking at the bat objective, or in green, so how much weight the bat objective received, um, and then as well as the other objectives. So those other objectives, remember, are um, water quality, cost, and landowner acceptance. So as you can imagine, this status quo here, where the cursor is, this has you know, got zero, zero um, cares from the bat objective. So the bats doing status quo was not going to achieve the bat objective at all, according to what Jonah predicted, uh, or what Jonah assumed. The other individual treatments here, most of them fell below the status quo. 
So meaning either they just weren't anticipated to do very well for the bats or they were not anticipated to do well for the bats or the other objectives. There are some that did come above the status quo um, with one in particular, this is a vaccine treatment. This was estimated to be do very well for the bat objective as well as, um, you know, minimize, maybe maximize costs. So maybe not, not be doing well for cost, but it was going to hopefully as estimated minimize water contamination, minimize or maximize landowner approval. When coming to the combo treatments over here, we can see that by adding maybe multiple single treatments together, the um, effect or the positive benefit for the bat objective was maximized. So a lot of these are gonna be doing very well compared to um, just the single treatments alone. And so that's based off of what our um, scientific science experts estimated. One thing I do want to say is that, you know, these estimates can be updated and likely will be as more information becomes evidence because sometimes um, many folks think, well, shoot, there's not enough information out there. Um, what if we estimate things wrong? And that's okay. That's again why, why this is an iterative process because we can keep going back and update um, the weights of the objectives, update our predictions, and then that can help make a better management action. <clears throat> So to examine the robustness of the optimal single and combination treatments of the analysis, we performed um, what's called a sensitivity analysis. And what we did was adjusted the weight of each fundamental objective from zero to one while holding the rest of them proportionally constant. So I'm just gonna show the weight for bat persistence here. So again, um, Jonah cared for bats. He had 57% of his cares was going to bats. That's how much he valued the bats. So that's what this vertical line is here. If you were to um, make uh, the weight of the bat objective down to zero, then the overall support for the status quo would be all the way up here. So basically, if you didn't care about bats at all, then keep going with the status quo. That's how this decision was coming out. As um, Jonah's weight or cares for the bats increased, that's when um, the overall support for the status quo then got lower. When we add, say, the vaccine treatment, which is the, one of the single treatments that uh, reached the highest, <clears throat> the decision then switched when uh, we reached a weight of, say, 0.25. So again, the original weight for the bat objective was 0.57. If Jonah only cared about bats about 25% of the time here, or 25% of his cares, he would still do something over doing nothing. So he's still going to opt to do something, whether it's a vaccine um, uh, over status quo. If we add the STEAM combo treatment or the PEG combo treatment, so these are just two combination treatments that were um, identified, again, the decision has changed even before you get to this 57% here. So if the weight of the bat objective got up to about 50%, 55%, you're going to opt to do something new, to do something definitely over the status quo. So regardless of, um, of the <clears throat> treatment, Jonah cared enough about bats that he was definitely going to do something. Um, it was just kind of coming up with what exactly was the next, the next thing. So this is showing that our model are, uh, is pretty robust, that um, you know, the, the predictions we made were fairly good. Um, and again, they can also be updated, but the predictions on how well the alternatives achieved the objectives seem to be um, pretty, um, pretty strong. So what is Texas doing now? They are actively implementing proactive white nose syndrome management. And this is really exciting. So what they opted for is even beyond what our um, optimal decision was. So we initially had thought about steam treatment uh, portfolio. So basically going into these culverts, um, using hot steam when the bats are not there. So we're thinking in the summertime, you know, bats are leaving these sites um, to go to their maternity or bachelor colonies, going in, removing any other bats that might still be present if there are ones or twos in there, um, steam cleaning it, and then, um, making, putting the bats back in there, maybe vaccinating bats if we can do it, if the vaccine is ready. Um, Jonas uh, worked with um, folks at Kennesaw State, um, you know, Chris Cornelison, and then also Barry Overton, and found that, that he really wanted to implement some sort of PEG um, op uh, option. So what they're doing now is that they're going into these culverts, 
don't know if you can see way deep in there is that these um, techs are going in making sure that no bats are present. So any bats that were in there originally, they're taking them out um, just temporarily. And then they go in there with this large backpack sprayer and are spraying down the inside of the culvert with um, PEG solution. And so this is pretty exciting. This is something that they're doing. Um, they've done it one full year now. And uh, I am eager to hear what the results are. But ultimately, the goal of PEG was just to make sure that it would go onto the culvert walls. And if PD was to become in, introduced, say, on a bat, it's, the PEG is going to prevent PD from um, reproducing. So hopefully keeping PD loads low. But what about natural hibernation sites? What does the optim, uh, optimal action or how does the optimal action differ? So, you know, again, Jonah was thinking about this in a culvert system, and he had um, pretty, like, few trade-offs. You know, he didn't have to think about non-target effects, didn't have to think about water quality really beyond what was already in a, a culvert system. Um, and so we had him go back to the drawing board and think about how he would reframe his decision problem and add more actions or think about other, excuse me, uh, objectives for um, considering doing an action, implementing an action in a natural cave ecosystem. And so he came up with um, two additional um, objectives. And so again, um, he had his bad objective, but as you can see, before it was about 0.57. Now his, the weight of, his, um, of this objective has been reduced because it is now going across additional objectives. So um, his, the weight of the bat objective was reduced by some. So now 31% of his cares or his values are going to bats. The cost increased, um, the, the weight of the cost was maybe a little bit more. He also increased or added a minimize harm to cave biology. And that was including SGCNs or species of greatest conservation need, um, ecosystem function. So he cared about the cave biology almost as much as he's caring about his um, bats. There is another um, uh, minimize harm to cave geology. And so that's thinking about <clears throat> how a treatment could maybe affect the, the inside of the cave and, and then, you know, downstream effects of that. And then this landowner um, stakeholder happiness one changed a bit and that it's not just about access and how many times you'd have to access a property. It's also considering uh, water quality because a lot of the caves in Texas have um, landowners that get their water from their cave sites. And so if the water became contaminated in a cave site due to a white nose syndrome treatment, you're likely to then not be able to go into that site again, lose access completely because um, of messing up the the quality of this water. So as you can see, these added objectives definitely switch and, and change the weight around as well as um, move or add different trade-offs among these objectives. So this um, is the entire list of the 22 different actions that we considered. <clears throat> I, um, I can I'm happy to share this PowerPoint so you can look into them more deeply. But the main thing here that I want to get home um, or send home to you is that the green here, so STEAM Portfolio 2 and PEG Portfolio 2, these were the two um, alternatives that became the highest ranked based off of um, the predictions on the objectives. So, um, you know, STEAM Portfolio was the one that was, you know, just well beyond the vaccine. PEG portfolio is kind of what they went with. And so basically that was treat the roost with PEG when bats are not at the site, treat bats with maybe kinosan or VOC during early hibernation, and then if possible, um, a vaccine. And so that was predicted to do well, not only for the bats, but also for the other objectives. Um, however, when you think about all the other objectives I just showed you for the cave um, theory or thinking about caves, those combo treatments and most of the other combo treatments are not doing so well. They perform less, uh, more poorly, they perform poorly compared to the culvert score. Whereas if you look up here, the vaccine treatment, um, which is just a direct application of vaccine on a bat, um, this is going to be the optimal decision for caves because it's minimizing any non-target, um, minimizing any water quality issues, 
uh, likely the action itself is going to be happening during summer or fall, so maybe not even at that site. So landowner approval is probably fine. Um, however, the cost, it's probably going to be high on cost um, because cost is not just the monetary value of the treatment, but also thinking about time and personnel that it goes into netting of that kind of effort. But you can see how these things are varying based off of the different trade-offs and the different management objectives, as well as the values that Jonah had put on those objectives. So when it comes to defining risk in a decision analysis context, decision makers generally fall within three categories. There's risk seeking, risk neutral, and risk averse. And um, typically the risk, um, the managers kind of fall within a risk neutral to risk averse. But um, here I have a utility plot where the probability of bat uh, population decline is here on the x-axis um, and the utility <clears throat> uh, or the manager happiness uh, values is on the y here. So a decision maker who is risk neutral has kind of a constant evaluation of risk. They're really happy when the uh, probability of bat population decline is low but as that probability incre increases or their populations decline, they become less and less happy um, and are ultimately very upset if they lose their entire population. A risk averse decision maker is really uncomfortable with any type of decline in population size. So you can think about how, um, you know, if Jonah is considering putting an action into his cave, maybe this is, you know, he doesn't want to see his bat population decline, but if you were to replace this X value here with, say, the probability of increased um, non-target effects, he's likely not going to, he'll be falling in the same thing because he's not going to be happy if he is causing a big um, uh, decline in those SGCNs in his cave. Um, and a decision maker who is risk seeking can really tolerate high levels of population decline. So they're fine until a moment uh, or a portion of the population decline, but maybe around 50% of population decline, then they become, um, their happiness drops off pretty quickly. So <clears throat> we could, as decision analysts, we think about these risk profiles as we're working through a decision making um, process, SDM workshop, um, because then we can incorporate these into the models directly or it can be exemplified in a way that manager can rank and score their management objectives. So again, thinking back to the scores that you saw above those objectives, you can kind of see where things um, change. In the culvert situation, maybe um, Jonah was going to be more risk neutral, maybe a little bit to the risk seeking. He's willing to do some pretty crazy things. But when thinking about doing it in a natural cave ecosystem, that's when his profile is going to change to that risk averse. So, and Texas was willing to implement management when the trade-offs were eliminated, so such as those artificial hibernation sites, which is great. However, the management in natural cave setting involved trade-offs where there's non-target species, water quality considerations, habitat alteration, and that really um, changed the optimal decision based off of how um, he was unwilling to make some of those trade-offs, which is, you know, perfectly useful and interesting and um, what we want to have happen in these decision-making contexts. And that's why we think about these in these stepwise progressions. So in thinking about those other two managers that we've worked with, um, how do the decisions vary in Idaho and Vermont? So um, just a reminder for Texas, the trigger was a single species in tricolored bats. It was just Jonah making the decision. He was the only management authority. The scale was culverts in East Texas, and he really didn't have any constraints when it came to that culverts um, decision. And the uncertainty was mostly just in the efficacy of treatments. So for Alyssa in Vermont, um, you know, she had multiple species. She was really focused on uh, little brown bats, but she was also thinking about um, northern long-eared bats and Indiana bats and even some of the tricolor bats that were formerly in her system. The management authority was collaborative. So it was, you know, she manages the wildlife where the Nature Conservancy manages Aeolus Cave and the surrounding um, natural area. So at that workshop, we made sure that we had not only Alyssa, but had representatives and managers from TNC present as well, because we wanted their values, their objectives um, in that decision-making context. The scale was the cave, Aeolus Cave, as well as the surrounding forest in the natural area. And we wanted to also think about maternity sites because 
The, in Aeolus Cave, it's really hard to access bats. It's really hard to make sure we know exactly where the bats are, but they have a lot of long-term banding data where Alyssa knows exactly where some of these bats are going. And so she has known maternity sites, which could be where some actions could occur. Uh, constraint is that it's a natural cave. Um, and then the uncertainty is again in the efficacy and treatments, but also the species distribution on the landscape. She does have a really good idea of where the maternity sites are, but there's likely other places that um, are being used by these bats where she can't really get to them. For Idaho with Rita Dixon, um, the trigger was multiple species. So again, she has multiple myotis species in Cornerinus townsendii that are using this cave. So she has to think about all of them because the myotis species are likely species to be affected by white nose syndrome and Cornerinus townsendii are species of concern out in the West. Um, the authority again is collaborative. So Rita manages the bats, but the US Forest Service manages Minnetonka Cave and the surrounding forest area. The scale is the cave in the surrounding forest. The constraints are that it's a natural uh, tourist cave. So there are non-target effects that are gonna occur, but also there's this element of uh, the commission or the money that's coming in um, from tourist dollars. And then the uncertainty is the efficacy and the treatments, the species distribution in the landscape and the species susceptibility, because that is a big unknown um, for Idaho at least. Although some species in Wyoming uh, or North Dakota and, and Washington, they have found that, you know, uh, certain species are becoming um, positive and affected by white nose syndrome. So for the actions, um, we can see variations in the possible management actions across all three of our managers. So again, status quo was considered because that is a pretty um, standard one to bring in. Um, that is a decision. Uh, Vermont was thinking more about incentives for landowners, enhanced maternity roost habitat, land protection and purchasing, and cave area closures. And that ultimately is because Alyssa was risk averse. She's, all, she's already lost, um, you know, 230,000 bats possibly from white nose syndrome based off of their um, hibernacula counts. And so she is absolutely not willing to lose any more, but she is willing to think about other ways of maybe um, maximizing their survival through um, maintaining better roost trees. That's what the incentives for landowners would be. Um, her own enhancing maternity roosts, buying more land, closing the cave off completely. And um, we know Texas was thinking about um, all sorts of crazy um, creative ideas, um, these big um, portfolios, because they didn't have to worry about any non-target effects. And in this type of scenario for culverts, Jonah was a little bit more risk seeking. Um, he could be, because he didn't have to worry too much about um, um, the, ruining the cave system. Rita was kind of a good mix. She was kind of a, a mix in her risk profile, I guess more risk neutral. Um, she was thinking about bat sheds, so putting out um, additional habitat for bats where something where she could maybe at these sheds implement a, a type of treatment um, if she needed to, if she couldn't do it in the cave system. She's also thinking about cave entrance remediation, UV treatment. And so this UV treatment was thinking along the lines of not just treating the bat wings, but actually treating, um, using UV to clean, quote unquote, the substrate that tourists are walking on, clean the um, uh, roost locations within the cave where bats were um, using them. Thinking about bat sheds, vaccine blints, Blitz, blitz and education outreach, and then also another UV maternity season vaccinations. So um, you can see how widely diverse the different um, actions were, at least the top four actions that were considered among these different managers, which is pretty exciting. Um, and that shows that they're being very creative. And, you know, basically no matter the flavor or suite of management actions identified, all had uncertainties that range from not knowing the efficacy of the management action based on the species composition, timing and duration of application, site access, or how to treat enough of the free-flying bat population, non-target impacts, et cetera. So these are all things that they're thinking about when working through here. So we know that Texas made a decision. They were kind of doing this one here where they opted for a PEG, VOC, and possibly some vaccine stuff going on. Um, but what did Vermont and Idaho do? So, um, with Aeolus Cave and Alyssa, she is, <clears throat> again, like I said, risk averse, does not want to really do anything to the cave habitat uh, or the bats because she already has lost 
a lot of individuals, and that is completely understandable. So things that she was looking at are added protection, purchasing land, um, which are things that are really important to her and actually more within reason. Um, and so the other things that were really interesting by th going through this process or the SDM process, Alyssa was able to clarify her management objectives so that when she gets the barrage of researchers wanting to research the remaining little brown bat population, she can ask them directly if their research are going to help her answer these certain management objectives. And that's great because that can help her differentiate between research for the sake of research and research, research for the sake of improving her information gain for future decision making. And that's something that was a, a, sub, a subsequent objective that she wanted that we wanted to make sure we achieved. For Rita, um, she decided to uh, look at the option for cave remediation. So this cave opening may look pretty good right here, but apparently when you go farther in, it's narrowed down to a person-sized door that's a bat-friendly uh, gate. But she's starting to think about, you know, is, are there ways that she can improve the habitat for the bats by um, altering that, uh, you know, human adaptive landscape? while also maybe minimizing the hospitality for, or the hostility for the, uh, for PD. And again, she's thinking of putting these bat sheds up at varying stages from the hibernacula to a lake that's a couple miles away because she can offer additional habitat <clears throat> or maternity roost sites for um, the various species, while also thinking ahead that if PD does become um, are found in this site, she can maybe start doing something like what Joan is doing, where she can uh, peg or, you know, put peg in these, vaccinate bats from here, or do something that maybe she wouldn't normally be able to do within um, the natural cave setting and without having to close the cave down completely. So with that, um, <clears throat> oops, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of mess up here. Um, my email address is rbernard at usgs.gov, so feel free to contact me at any time. Um, these are all the folks that helped us out with these workshops, and by helping, I mean they did all the hard work, um, predicting, uh, making objectives, and thinking about these alternatives, and then as well as the various um, funding agencies. And if there is time, I'm happy to take any questions you may have.